Welcome back to Guitar Discoveries and my first video ever about what I learned from a drummer. In this case, the one and only Ringo Starr of The Beatles. Now, I've been doing a series on what I learned from each of The Beatles, starting with John Lennon, and then I jumped over to George Harrison, and then back to Paul McCartney. And it was my wife, Bara, she's my musical partner in our band Cosmic Spin, she said to me, you gotta do Ringo. And of course she was right, because Ringo taught me just as much about musicianship as any of his bandmates did. And you might not know this about me, but I've been playing and programming drums and percussion parts since the 90s. I do it for my own solo music, I do it for much of what I produce for other artists, and for my band Cosmic Spin. And I really look to Ringo as the master of feel. I'll explain what I mean in this video. Now, I'm also going to go deep on what I learned from the fifth Beatle, producer and orchestrator George Martin. So please make sure to like, subscribe, and hit the bell if you haven't already. I don't want you to miss that when it goes live. All right, Ringo Starr, Mr. Peace and Love. Known since 1963 for his sense of humor, his playfulness. Are you a mod or a rocker? Um, no, I'm a mocker. <laughs> and really for being the perfect drummer for the world's most beloved band. Now, there are always two warring camps when it comes to Ringo. People who say he wasn't technically impressive, and others who say he was the master. Now, this is really the same disagreement that happens with every member of the Beatles. Are they great, mediocre, the best, just average? Why is it that people disagree about the skill level of all four Beatles? Well, stay with me. I'm going to attempt to answer those questions, and I will share the three most important lessons I learned from Ringo Starr. So in Ringo's case, whenever he's criticized or underrated, you can pretty much assume it's because he wasn't flashy. He played on a simple Ludwig kit with just four drums. Kick, snare, mounted tom, and floor tom, plus a hi-hat, a crash cymbal, and a ride cymbal. I mean, basic, almost minimalist by today's standards. But it was just perfect for his less is more style of drumming. And that's Ringo lesson number one. Do the most with the least. Ringo proved you don't need a big kit to get a huge variety of drum sounds, especially when you work with a creative team that pushed the boundaries of recording technology. Now, Ringo is also a left-handed player, but he plays a right-handed kit. Now, here's what he says about that. When I was born, I was left-handed, but my grandmother thought I was overpowered by witches and made me write with my right. So I have a, a right-handed kit, but I lead with my left. Something else is that he tuned the drums low and sometimes put tablecloths over them so they'd sound tight. I mean, low and tight. That's how I want to play everything. Okay, so these unusual choices are some of the ways Ringo developed his own sound and style from such a simple setup. Now, to prepare for this video, I did a lot of listening and I watched a bunch of other videos about Ringo, and I really loved some of the things that people say about him. His fills are part of the melody. His playing always adds distinctive and memorable color without getting in the way of the song. Another person called him a great storyteller on the drums. And my favorite, he did the right thing at the right time, in perfect time, without overdoing it and always being creative. So Ringo was known for checking his ego at the door. He intuitively understood the role of a drummer and what it means to support and contribute to the music. And this is the same thing I said about George in my video about what I learned from him. So George and Ringo were both masters of playing just the right thing in the context of the song and the mood. And that's Ringo lesson number two, always serve the song. That's harder and rarer than it sounds. So Ringo had to follow some unwritten rules to accomplish that. Keep it simple, don't overplay, and never show off. So there's a fun video from the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame where a group of today's drum legends share what they think of Ringo. Here are session legend Jim Keltner and Nirvana drummer Dave Grohl. You know, he's a song drummer. Guys that, that sit down and they hear the song and then they play appropriately for that song. To find the best drummer in the world, is it someone that's technically proficient or is it someone that sits in the song with their own feel. Ringo was the king of feel. Now, if you watch the Beatles' three-part Get Back documentary, talking about nine hours of footage, you're going to notice that in the rehearsals, Ringo spends most of his time listening. 
He never forces his way into the creative process of the other guys. And that was his MO, right? Listen first, absorb the song, then play what it needs, and no more. So here's what George Harrison said about that particular trait. He listened to the song once, and he knows exactly what to play. I often talk about guitar orchestration when individual guitar parts interweave and work together to create something synergistic. You know, the same way the instruments of an orchestra each play their role and contribute to the whole. Now, in my opinion, Ringo was really the first orchestral or compositional rock drummer. He didn't just keep a beat. You know, his drum parts were woven into each song. And that's why lots of people can identify a Beatles song just by hearing the drum parts. Okay, let's have some fun and see if you can identify these songs from their drum parts. That's Ticket to Ride. How about this? Tomorrow Never Knows. And this. Strawberry Fields Forever. How about... A Day in the Life. Or this kickoff. Yep, that's birthday. All right, how many did you get? Now, if you're a Beatles fan, you probably got all of them. So we just proved that Ringo's drum parts are unique and memorable. He listens to the vocals. He says, I never wanted to fill and get in the way of vocals. I'll play a fill only when necessary and, and it works for the song. And man, that is advice that every musician needs to hear and absorb, right? I've got to check my ego at the door and so should you. And hey, I'm a Leo, so that's not always easy for me, okay? So there are a couple videos in my library that explain how to conquer any of your show-off tendencies when you're playing live or in the studio. First one is a short reminder that music is not a competitive sport. Listening and playing in context are really the keys to great musicianship. They're two of the main reasons the Beatles' music stands out and lives on after more than 50 years. They had this balanced collaboration. They each worked from their strengths and stayed out of each other's way. And that's one of the most important things you can do as a musician. Now, the other video is about two questions to ask yourself before you play any solo. It really works for me, helps me play the right solo for each song. Now, one hallmark of drummer egos is the extended drum solo. But in all Ringo's years with the Beatles, he never played a solo live, and the one short eight-bar solo he did play was on one of the Beatles' last recorded tracks, The End. And even to do that, he had to be talked into it by the other three Beatles. They each played their solos, and they wanted Ringo to play one, too. Okay, my favorite Ringo lesson, number three, find the groove, deepen it, and swing it. One thing I find remarkable and totally consistent about Ringo's parts is how relaxed they all sound. I mean, he almost always plays just behind the beat. You know, he, he pulls on the beat as opposed to pushing it. And that pull makes it feel groovier, right? It feels a little funky, it makes you wanna move. Here's Taylor Hawkins of the Foo Fighters, RIP. It's a Ringo swing. He kind of washes the windshield on the hi-hats, man. I mean, it's a fucking Ringo thing. It's like a, a style of music. So even in 2-4 and 4-4 time signatures, you know, typical of straight-ahead rock, Ringo usually plays with an underlying triplet feel, and that kind of makes the beat roll, right? I mean, that's the second part of rock. It's rock and roll. All right, check out All My Lovin'. This is in 4-4 time, but Lennon's rhythm guitar is playing triplets all the way through, and Ringo just swings it. Tell Me Why is also in 4-4, but it has that relaxed triplet vibe again. Dun, 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 dun. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. There's always this underlying three, even when it's going one, two, three, four. If Ringo had played in a straight 4-4 four, four with eighth notes, it would have sounded like this. Tell me why you cry. I mean, way less original, right? So Ringo is well known as a lover of country music, which also often uses kind of easygoing triplets. So they show up again on one of Ringo's vocal songs, Act Naturally. It's a fast three. 
Okay, jumping forward to 67 and Sgt. Pepper's A Day in the Life. Those low-tuned fills are, you guessed it, relaxed triplets. No straight eighth notes. Now, if you still have any doubt about Ringo's knack for finding and deepening the groove and swinging it, listen to what Abe Laboreal Jr. from Paul McCartney's touring band says. You know, it's, some, it's that sloppy, swampy, falling down the stairs kind of sound that is, it is the coolest thing ever. And here's more proof. Here's Dave Grohl again to sum it up. Honestly, if if you're a drummer and you can do this and have people dancing, you're a fucking badass. All right, finally, a Ringo bonus lesson. Don't fear odd time signatures. Now, in my blow-up of Strawberry Fields, I explained John's odd choice of meters in the chorus. Rhythmically, he also drops a few beats during the chorus. The way I feel the rhythm, it's straight 4-4 four, four, until a bar of two beats on Nothing 2 and a bar of three beats on Strawberry Fields. It's like this. Nothing is one, two, three, four, and one, two, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, one, two, three, four. There you go. Here's the actual drum part. Unhappiness is a warm gun. The mother superior jump the gun section. It bounces between 9-8 and 10-8. Ringo makes it sound easy. In my blow up of Here Comes the Sun, I explained George Harrison's odd time signatures in the Sun 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 bridge, 5 4 and 4 4. Now, the bridge time signature is interesting too. Each phrase is one bar of 5 4 time followed by two bars of 4 4, all repeated five times. Uh, let's count it. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. When Ringo does it, it just sounds so natural, so right. I mean, really, peace and love. So there you go, the three most important things I learned from Ringo Starr. Number one, do the most with the least. Number two, always serve the song. Number three, find the groove, deepen it, and swing it. My wife Barra and I have a band called Cosmic Spin, and I do all the drum and percussion parts. I can't even tell you how much influence Ringo's feel and swing have on how I build a groove. I mean, if, if the beat doesn't pull a little and make you feel it, we're not even interested. So, thank you, Ringo. Okay, my next video will be what I learned from the fifth Beatle, producer and arranger George Martin. Ah, so much to share. So please make sure you're subscribed. Might take a while because I shoot, record, and edit these videos myself totally as a hobby. But while you wait, please watch some of the many videos I've made over the past five years. Visit guitardiscoveries.com. You're going to find over 200 videos in the archives. Most of them are here on YouTube as well. Or you can just go here. <laughs>